sure I've told you that was uh, my mom and dad's favorite song. Grew up hearing it sung in our house all the time. Uh, it's kind of hard to sometimes pick music to go along with these lessons on Sunday nights where we're talking about Jesus in the Old Testament, as well as it is to find a, a scripture. The, the scripture we read, Jeremiah 31, is just kind of a starting point. We'll be talking about Jeremiah some tonight, but uh, it's not like we're going to take a lot of time and exposit that scripture, but um, we s introduced the prophets last week, um, in part one, we'll do part two tonight, and part three next week, and as we've been saying, the prophets all speak of Jesus' first and second coming, um, his lineage, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection, and, and then of course his second coming as well, our not always explicitly prophesied, you know, there are some prophecies that are very obvious, which we'll, some we'll look at tonight. Last week we looked at Isaiah 53, and again in Sunday school this morning, but uh, a lot of times there's just sort of a foreshadowing uh, that points to the Messiah or the need for a Messiah, the need for a Savior. Um, sometimes an entire chapter will speak of changes to the, uh, the nation, the land, uh, the establishment of justice and peace and the punishment of evil and the righting of wrongs that will come when Messiah rules and reigns on the earth. And what a time that will be. If we just look at what's going on in our world today and all of the corruption and, again, uh, whatever happens in the election, uh, however, it ends up being decided. Isn't it interesting we have to say how it will be decided? It's not when all the votes are counted. It's going to be litigated, I'm sure. And why does it need to be litigated? Because people are dishonest and they've done things to try to uh, alter the outcome and things like this. And we, we can only hope. You know, I, I guess the question I have is once that's all litigated and worked out and settled, then what? What's next? You know, if the president wins, are we out of the out of uh, out of the out of trouble, out of the blue into the blue? Or what am I trying to say? Uh, are we in the clear? Does that mean justice and righteousness is going to roll like a river down through it? No, not at all. There'll still be more. I mean, what were the last four years like? If Mr. Biden wins, is it going to be the end of the world? Uh, no. It may very well be the end of. The republic as we know it, if he does the things that his party wants him to do, I don't even put it on him. I don't think he's even, you know, I don't, I don't mean any disrespect when I say this. I, I, I seriously don't know if he's aware of what's going on half of the time. And, and that's a terrible thing. I've asked you to pray for him because he's cognitively just not right. But, I mean, the world's a mess. We've got election fraud and, and fraud and deceit everywhere and and software that's been designed to alter things. And, and if you saw yesterday, there was a, a rally in Washington, D.C., and a bunch of people came and, I mean, nearly killed a man in the street. And, and nothing, you know, I guess the people were arrested, but they'll be probably charged with disorderly conduct and slapped on the wrist and sent home. You know, how, how long have we seen corrupt politicians getting away with it, nothing ever being done? Uh, you know, it's... I think the more I see of this world, the more I long for the day when Messiah will reign on earth, you know, and there will be perfect justice and perfect righteousness. And that's not going to happen, sorry to tell you, until Jesus comes. And sometimes we romanticize. We think back to, oh, if it were only like it was in the, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Well, guess what? There was a lot going on then, too, you know. Well, maybe we weren't as aware of it as we are now because of the constant news cycle and the uh, internet and all those things. But this world is a fallen, <laughs> seeping, stinking pile of festering sin and corruption and unrighteousness. And, you know, Jesus is going to come one day and set it all straight. But until then, this is where we live. Um... When 
Messiah comes, it'll be for all the nations, just as it was promised. In, in Genesis chapter 12, Ab the Lord spoke to Abram before he was Abraham, said, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you, I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and listen, I will bless those that bless you, I will curse those that curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did Jesus come to save just Israel? No. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we're going to look tonight at one, two, three, four, five, six, six more prophets. Uh, some a little bit more in depth than others, but let's look at it. First of all, tonight we begin with Micah. Micah was called from his home to be a prophet, left his familiar surroundings to deliver a very stern message of judgment to the princes of Israel. Uh, he was a contemporary of Isaiah. He preached to the country, whereas Isaiah spoke mostly to the cities. Micah spoke to the southern kingdom of Judah. His name, Micaiahu, means who is like Jehovah. Uh, it's shortened to Micaiah in, in uh, chapter 7, verse 18. He hints that his own name of the phrase, who is a God like you? Um, Micah is the, the Hebrew name of the book. Um, Micah, Micah's main pr purpose was to call Judah to repentance and righteousness and to return to the Lord. In the midst of Micah, we have this wonderful promise that's, uh, and again, we're coming up on it here in Micah 5 and 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, who's going forth from of old, even from everlasting. There's nothing really very ambiguous about that. He was prophesying that this would, Bethlehem, little city of Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the Messiah, who was the Ancient of Days, the, the, whose going forth was from old, even from everlasting. We see uh, Messianic references in uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I'll put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of the pasture. Uh, they shall make a loud noise because so, of so many people. The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and will go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. Jesus will lead his flock like a shepherd, it says in uh, Isaiah. Uh, all of these, uh, chapter 4, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They shall abide, and from, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. When the Assyrian comes to the land, he will tread in their palaces. Then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. Wonderful passage prophesying Messiah leading his sheep like a flock, like, like a shepherd. A very interesting verse in uh, chapter 7, I want to call your attention to, uh, verses 8 and 9. He says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. And I will see his righteousness. The promise that Jesus will intercede for us and forgive us. And though we sit in the darkness of our own sin and the indignation of our sin, uh, Jesus will come and plead our case and execute justice for us on our behalf. So Micah speaks in some veiled terminology here, but there is that very unambiguous promise of uh, to Bethlehem, that it would be the place of Jesus' birth. Then we come to Nahum. Nahum, uh, which, like Jonah, preached to the Assyrians, the Ninevites. 
after repenting at the preaching of Jonah, the Assyrians kind of fell back into their sinful ways and resumed and even escalated their evil deeds. And Nahum powerfully demonstrates God's sovereignty. Uh, there really aren't any messianic prophecies in Nahum to speak of, but his name means comfort. Nahum 1 and verse 4, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry, dries up all the rivers. I mean, that kind of alludes to, remember in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26 where Jesus rebuked the winds and the seas and made, made them calm. But Nahum reminds us that God will comfort after the judgment. And so, uh, that's Nahum. Okay. Then there's Zephaniah. Zephaniah preached to Judah during the reign of King Josiah. Like many of the prophets, especially uh, Joel, he spoke of the day of the Lord where sin will be punished and justice will prevail and the faithful remnant will be saved in light of Jesus' own words. We know that that's a reference to his second coming, the day of the Lord. Remind you that uh, we, we, we looked at all of this back in the spring, right, when COVID was hitting and we thought, boy, is this it or what, you know. Um, we were in the Olivet Discourse and in Acts chapter 2 and verse 19, Peter says, I will show wonders, he's quoting from Joel now, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the, com before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. There's the prophecy. These things will happen before the day of the Lord. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, he says, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, right? Matthew 24, here's the passage. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, powers of heaven will be shaken. This is all in Acts chapter 2 and in Joel. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of the heavens to the other. Uh, Zephaniah 3, verses 8 through 20, describes in some detail the conversion of the nations at Messiah's reign, and when they shall all serve him, it says, with one accord. You can take that, write, jot that down, Zephaniah 3, verses 8 through 20, and look that up later on. It says in verse 8 that he'll judge the nations, in verse 15, he'll dwell in the midst of them. And so I think that's a, a pretty clear reference to Messiah's uh, millennial reign. Okay? Okay? You tracking so far? That's an army thing. Tracking? All right. And we come to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Uh, we spent a year in Jeremiah, so we'll skip that. No, no, not really. Um, Jeremiah spends 50 years from the time of Josiah to the conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, Jeremiah is known as what? The, the weeping prophet, right? Like Jesus, he wept over Jerusalem. He was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Many, many foreshadowings of Jesus. Of course, he announces the new covenant that we just looked at and we read moments ago. Chapter 23, Jeremiah speaks of uh, Christ as the righteous branch. Um, sorry, Let's find where I am here. 23 verses uh, 5 through 8. Um, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he will be called. Whoa. The Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu in Hebrew. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, 
that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. What's he saying? I'm going to bring you back from the captivity, and that's going to make you forget all about the captivity in Egypt because it's going to be even greater when I bring you back into the land after this. That's going to be... Uh, I mean, it's going to rival the, the exodus. I mean, it's, it's going to be that big of an event. And he said, you won't think about back to Egypt anymore. You'll remember this. Um, in chapter 2, verse 13, speaks of the fountains of living water. And in chapter 8, in verse 22, the great physician. Um, that's where it talks about the balm in Gilead. Um, Chapter 31 talks about the good shepherd. Uh, in chapter 50, it talks about God is our redeemer. Chapter 15, verse 34. Uh, here we see the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah uh, suffered in many of the same ways that Jesus would. He wept over Jerusalem. He reminds us that man cannot save himself. We are utterly dependent on God. In uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you know, it's not by, it's by grace that you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Uh, Titus 3, 5 talks about, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us. In Matthew chapter 16, in verse 13, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I am? And some of them said, well, John the Baptist and Elijah. Some others said Jeremiah. So people even confused Jesus with maybe Jeremiah had come back or something. One of the prophets. And then we find this passage in Jeremiah 11 and verse 19. Where he says, I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter. I did not know that they had devised schemes against me saying, let, let, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name may be remembered no more. Jeremiah compares himself to the lamb that was, would be slain. So there's all sorts of, again, foreshadowings, if not overt prophecies of Jesus and Jeremiah. And then, of course, Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. Lamentations. Right. Lamentations. Um, which is his lament, his... his Mourn, song of mourning, if you will, over the city of the fallen city of Jerusalem. Of course, all of that foreshadows what Jesus prayed and, and cried in uh, Matthew 23 and verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to her, how often would I want to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We saw Nehemiah weep over Jerusalem. We saw Jeremiah weep over Jerusalem. Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, Lamentations 3, uh, verses 22 through 24, right in the middle. And, and I, I shared this with you a couple weeks ago. Jeremiah, or uh, Lamentations, rather, is one of those acrostics. Uh, the, the first two chapters, chapter 1 and 2, and 4 and 5 all have 22 verses. Each one starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, alphabetically. And then uh, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And then the third chapter is the longest, and it has 66 verses because there's three verses per letter. So the, the first three verses all start with the Aleph, and then the second three start with a base, and then the third start with a gimel, and, and it goes on way, all the way down through the Hebrew alphabet. But probably the most familiar and the central of all these verses is uh, chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Though the Lord's mercies are not, con through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says 
my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Our hope is in the Lord. And no matter what happens, our hope is in the Lord. If the mountains crumble and the nations are cast into the sea, our hope is still in the Lord, right? And the main theme of this book is the judgment of God on the sins of his people and his faithfulness through all of it. And the people are still justified in hoping for God's justice and compassion. Jeremiah is a type of Christ as a weeping man, prophet, the man of sorrows, despised and rejected and mocked by his enemies. But the message of hope points us to Christ and his redemptive work. In, in uh, verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I'll hope in him. What's that song, Sarah? If Jesus is my portion, my constant friend indeed, and if his eye is on the sparrow, I know that he watches me, right? You ought to hear Sarah sing that song if you haven't. All right, we're cruising right along, huh? Chapter number six, Habakkuk. I love Habakkuk. Habakkuk's a great, great, great little book. Like Job, Habakkuk, or as I heard one, one man call it, Habakkuk, Habakkuk questions God's actions and his justice. Um, why would God use a wicked empire like the Babylonians to accomplish his perfect purpose? To punish Judah for her sins. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There's strife and contention that arises. Therefore, the law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Does that sound familiar? Verse 6. Indeed, God says, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to send the Chaldeans. Habakkuk says in so many words, <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, they're worse than us. He says uh, in verse 12, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You have marked them for correction. Um, your eyes are pure you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? He's, he's not, it, it's written as a statement in, in our Bibles, but I think it's more of a question, you know? You mark them for correction? That's your plan? How are you going to use them? Your eyes are too holy to look on evil. God, don't you know what they're into? I mean, they're worse than us. And then God answers Habakkuk, and the essence of the book is Christ-centered message, really the, mess, the essence of all of Scripture. Uh, Luther's life verse, if you will. Chapter 2 and verse 4. The just shall live by faith. And we are saved by grace through faith. And we must live and walk by faith. That's the one and only path to eternal life. Romans 1.17 In it, the righteousness of God is revealed, talking about the gospel, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 But by grace you've been saved, through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Galatians 3.11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For, how do we know? The just shall live by faith. Right? As far as uh, messianic prophecies, some scholars look at chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea, um, 
does something very similar to that in uh, in, in Psalm 72 and verse 19. Blessed be his glorious name forever and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. I wish we could have added that little chorus into uh, all creatures of our God and King. Who, a second chapter of Acts recorded it that way. In the middle of it they add in that chorus. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy is the Lord. Isaiah 6 and verse 3. The angels, the seraphim, cried to one another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then we find a very, very interesting passage here in chapter 3. Look at verse 3. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Haran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Isaiah 40 and verse 5 says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's what we celebrate this time of year, isn't it? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Shepherds were abiding in a field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Suddenly an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you great good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men of goodwill. Right? The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. What's that going to look like? Wow. Suddenly. Suddenly. My favorite word. Best word in the Bible. Jeremiah prophesies in 31, 33, and 34. So widespread, so universal will be the knowledge of the Lord that the people will not need to be told about him anymore. They'll know him. That will be accomplished and, and complete along with the forgiveness of all their sins for all who, it says, know him. That is to put their faith and trust in him. Do you know the Lord? Have you put your trust in him? Do you know him as your Savior? If you do, you, know, you don't need to be told of his glory. You've experienced it for yourself. And he says the whole earth is going to experience this one day. And then we have chapter 3 of Habakkuk. And I love this. Because what's going on is that Habakkuk is crying out to God and saying, you know, God, your nation, your people are so wicked. They're so steeped in sin. How can you even stand us anymore? And God says, I got it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to send the Chaldeans. And they're going to come in and clean house. And he says, what? The Chaldeans, they're worse than us. And God says, the just shall live by faith, which in modern vernacular is, hey, trust me. Trust me, I got this. And that's kind of the backdrop. He's crying out for revival. He's crying out for God to move and do something. And then we have chapter 3. Just read this with me. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigianoth. Now, it says in my Bible, the meaning of that is unknown. Um, one of the theories about that is that Shigeanoth is a uh, kind of a tune. And that it was set to music to that tune. So that you could sing it. Okay? O Lord, I have heard your speech and I was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from... What, what, what happened? What just happened there? What just happened there? Suddenly. Suddenly. He's praying for God to come. He's praying for God to appear, for God to come and make his... 
his presence known and to remember mercy in the midst of wrath. And there all of a sudden, God came. God showed up. What does that even look like? Can you, can you even wrap your head around that? When God comes. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand. And there was power. His power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and, and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. The everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed down. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, and curtains in the midst of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses and your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. See that word Selah? It's in verse 3. It's in verse 9. It's again in verse 13. You know what that means? Musical term. In music would say we would say rest. But it means more than that. Because it's placed throughout the Psalms. This is the only place outside of the Psalms that it appears in the Old Testament. It appears three times in this one chapter. You know what he's saying? I'm praying for God to come and restore things. I'm praying for God to come and fix the mess that we live in. All the unrighteousness, all the wickedness, all the sinfulness, all the injustice in our nation. And God came. And his glory filled the entire earth. Pause. Stop. Think that over. Meditate on that. My friend Larry Savage used to say, let that sink in. What's that going to look like? What's it look like when God comes? And he finishes it up, verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree, what's the fig tree? Israel. Israel. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. Though the labor of the olive may fail, the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, there's no herd in the stalls. What's that sound like? No fruit. No harvest. No herd. In, what? Great famine. Ah, Amos talks about that. There's a famine. Not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the word of God. No herd in the stalls. You know what that reminds me of? Have a look. Where's the flock? Where's the flock? And it's not just Emmanuel Baptist Church. Most churches don't even have a service tonight. They don't have Sunday night services anymore. You know why? Nobody came. Nobody comes. You know how many empty churches there are in this city alone, across this country? You want to talk about Europe for a minute? Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on high hills. You know what? If God comes... Suddenly, it can happen overnight. I can tell you stories of great revivals, many of which happened in, well, not my lifetime, but just before my lifetime. 
Anybody know the name Duncan Campbell? The Hebrides revival that took place in the 1950s? We'll talk about that. Maybe I'll talk about that on Wednesday night. Because we're out of time now. But God came suddenly. Suddenly. The Brownsville revival. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and. We're not going to have, uh, I mean, we got, little, going all that. we got gold speckles on the ceiling, but I don't expect your teeth to suddenly be filled with gold if that's what you're, <laughs> we'll talk about it on Wednesday. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promise of your word, the promise that you are always nigh, and that you hear us when we pray, and that, as Del Fazenfeld said, that as long as God is on the throne, the promise of revival is as real as the sun coming up in the morning. Father, please to revive us, revive your church. In the, in the midst of wrath, Lord, remember mercy. Remember mercy. Won't you come, Lord, and revive us again. We pray in Jesus' name.